Good morning. I guess it's, we're almost afternoon now, but I will try to keep it within the morning so that you guys can enjoy your lunch. I'm here today to talk to you about lighting that fire within. And in particular, about having a gold medal performance. And for me, about finding, oh, thank you, about finding that inner leader inside of me. Many of you know, and as I was just introduced, my team recently won gold medal in curling at the 2014 Olympics. But what you don't know is what it took to get there, the trials and the tribulations. And that's what I want to share with you today. So I'm going to just start a little bit about the evolution of our team and, and the missing link. So our team over the past decade was ranked number one in the world for most of it. And there has been three Olympics uh, since, the, since our kind of uh, proficiency in curling, I guess. We were favored in the, for the 2006 Olympics in, in Torino. We were favored heading into those Olympic trials, but that was really at the beginning of when our team started in 2005. That's the year that we won our first Canadian championship. And we were favored heading into those trials, but it just didn't work out. We didn't make the playoffs, and we just felt that we were too green. Uh, we, we really didn't self-reflect and, and really look upon that performance and just felt that we needed more experience. So we carried on. And in the next four years, we won three more, three more Canadian championships and a world championship, and we set Canadian curling records. Uh, we were favored to go to Vancouver, no question, we are we are number one in the world heading into those Olympic trials. And not only did we not go to Vancouver, we didn't make the playoffs. We didn't even have a sniff at the playoffs. We were terrible at the Olympic trials. It's the worst that we've ever played in our entire lives. And it was after that that I really reflected. We had set, we had won four Canadian championships and set records in women's curling. Uh, we had achieved more than I ever dreamed possible. But my dream was to always go to the Olympics. And it's like you almost think, well, maybe it's just not meant to be. And I hate those words because I always feel that you can achieve anything you set your mind to. But it just felt like we had tried so hard, we had practiced so hard, we had done all of these things, and maybe it wasn't meant to be. We just weren't meant to go to the Olympics. So shortly after we lost to go to the Vancouver Olympics, I got a call from Yahoo Sports to go and cover the games. And it's something that I've always wanted to do. I wanted to be a broadcaster. So I thought, maybe this is the silver lining. This is the reason that we suck so bad, is that so I could go and, 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 and see what it was like to go on the dark side. No offense to the media people in the crowd, but that's what we call it, the dark side. And it really is. It was me and a bunch of men on the media bench. Um, and, but, it, but what it did is it gave me a different perspective. And there's nothing, when you're competing, you're so focused. When I was sitting on that media bench, you could see the team dynamics. You could see the energy and the chemistry. You could witness it because you weren't a part of it. You had a, I had a back seat, and I, a front row seat, actually, and I could just see it. I knew from the very beginning of those Olympic Games what teams were going to make the playoffs. It was obvious to me. When I'm competing, is it obvious? No, absolutely not. You're so in the moment, and you have all of these great competitors that you don't know. But when you have that perspective, it was such a revelation for me. When I was sitting there, it's like an aha moment that we don't have that. We don't have that special magic. And then as we carried on, and I'm covering the curling, and Team Canada's Cheryl Bernard, uh, they made the gold medal game. And Cheryl's the skip of that team and one of my very best friends. And she had two shots to win a gold medal. Two shots to make her dreams come true. Two shots to prove that 20 years of work, dedication, sacrifice, two shots to stand on top of that podium. And they missed both. Their dreams were crushed. And it killed me because they're my, one of my, some of my closest friends, and I just wanted to jump over the boards and give them a big hug, but I'm on the dark side, so that's not really permitted. And, but what, would, what was special about that moment for me is what you don't maybe realize is, is athletes don't really have a ton of rights at the Olympics. So immediately following a match, you are required to go through the media scrum. You don't get to see your families. You don't get to regroup as a team. You immediately have to go see the media because they're on deadline and they want to get you right away. And you're forced to go through. You're forced. You even have to do media before you have to do doping, before you have to go pee. Even if you have to go to the bathroom, you got to hold it. You got to go through the media. So these girls came through after a devastating loss, a devastating loss. And Cheryl's always the last one. The skip is always the last one to come. So the three girls came before Cheryl, and they were all asked in the media about this shot, all of them. 
about how Cheryl let them down. And they all stood there, unrehearsed, because they wouldn't have had time, and they all stood there and said, there's nobody we'd rather have throw that shot. Cheryl's the reason that we stand here today. She's the reason we're at the Olympics, and there's nobody we'd rather have throw that shot. And I was in awe for those girls to feel it, to believe it, to show it, and to be such a strong team in such a devastating moment. I couldn't believe it, and it was another revelation. We didn't have that. We didn't have that. As much as we were talented and ranked number one in the world and we had all of these accolades and awards, we didn't have that magic, that team unity, that team trust as, as other speakers were speaking about today. And so I really self-assessed. And, and I sat there and I, it, it's really hard to kind of really get to the guts of it all. And I knew that we didn't bring out the best of each other in, in the biggest moments. So I came back from Vancouver, ready to retire before I left, and now full of energy and vigor and, and just a different perspective. And I sat down and with, with, uh, with our sports psychologist when I came back, and I kind of told him about my revelations. And, and I said, you know, and it's Cal Botterell, who's been to seven Olympics. I respect him so much, and he's worked with us for 10 years. And I, I said to him, Cal, I, I want this. I want this, this, this team dynamics. And, I need, to be, I need to be a leader. I could see it. All of these teams had this leader, and our team is lacking that. And I need to do that. I had to look inside at my feelings, which I hate doing. <laughs> Who likes to examine their feelings? And it was so hard. But I did it. And I sat there, and I, and I was talking to him. And he looked at me, and he says, Jennifer, why not you? Why not you? And he's right. Every one of us can achieve anything we set our minds to. And he said, why not you? And I said, but Cal, I'm so shy, and I'm introverted, and I'm going to have to be this leader. He's like, Jennifer, leadership is lonely. It's perfect for you. <laughs> I'm like, excellent. <laughs> but he was right. You can always find, and, and I do like solitude, and I do like, I, I, I enjoy that. But I needed to do this for my team, and I needed to find a way. So it was shortly after that, that we, we got together and we decided that we were gonna make a team change. We had lost our passion. We had lost our desire, our love. We lost the feeling of what, how many of you, when you're growing up and you go to the local hockey arena and it just smells a certain way? For me, the curling ice smelled so wonderful. It was like peace. It was like my mom's apple pie. And that was really good too but I forgot what the ice smelled like. So we decided we were gonna make this team change. And it was very public, very public. We were highly scrutinized. It, it was one of the worst things I've ever encountered. It went global. Like it was, it, it, it was picked up nationally with the newspapers and we were criticized, we were called names. It was unbelievable. And it was one thing for us to take it, but the hardest part of me was to see my mom to read in the paper every single day that her daughter was a, not a very nice person and to have to defend that to her friends. And everybody was passing judgment and not knowing all of the facts. And as the panel just said before us, the media can, you can't really believe and hold on to everything you read. But my mom had to stand there and listen to it all and defend it. I had to watch my mom cry because of something that I did. And it was so hard to stand there and believe that I know that we were doing the right thing for us. And my mom, you know what, she just stood by my side, as moms always do, and we decided to make this team change. So we got down, we got together after the change, and it was my first moment that I got to be a true leader, because I was the one that was taking the criticism in the paper. And I stood there on behalf of our team with my head held high, and I stood there, and the girls, every chance they had, they defended me. And we became a team in that split second that we were lacking for years. We are a united team, four people working together instead of four individuals. So we sat down together and we tried to figure out what our roles were going to be. We always treated it as a new team. Even though the three of us still continued, we were going to be one new team. We had a new person on the team, a new dynamic we wanted, a new passion. So we came down and we said, okay, we need a leader and Jennifer, that's your role. We want you to be the leader. Caitlin, who is 21 years old, completely unproven in the media, they couldn't believe that we, we had gone from to, to choose somebody that didn't have any experience. But what she had was passion, desire, dedication, work ethic. 
and a love that was infectious. She had everything we were looking for, and she had so much potential to be the best in the world. So Caitlin came on the team, and that's what she brought. And Jill always ensures that everybody's voice is heard. She's got this compassion about her that everybody's voice will be heard. And Dawn is so funny and lighthearted and easygoing that we almost had this perfect package, a puzzle that all came together. And so we worked with that. We worked with our team dynamics. And we sat down and we said, what else do we have to do to package this and make sure that when we go four years from now, we're going to bring our best? And the girls always say to me that I get this look about me. And when I get this look about me, they know we're going to be successful. I thought, how easy is that? If I was good at makeup, I would just paint it on. You know, how, how simple. It's such a simple thing. If I can look at them in a certain way, they feel at ease and confidence. And that, as a leader, that's what I can give for them. But again, I had to examine my feelings. <laughs> How do I feel when I get that look? And so I sat and I worked with our sports psychologist for a long time to try to develop that. But in retrospect, what I asked for them, in return, I said, if you expect me to look a certain way, then I expect you to look a certain way. And how I expect you to look is always ready and prepared and, and into it. Like, even if you have an, an hour sleep at night, I expect you to show up that next day and energized and excited. Sometimes you have to just fake it to make it. And that's what we decided we were going to do. We had a responsibility to each other to be and to act a certain way. And here's the girls. See, Dawn and Jill are always laughing, and Caitlin is, is just a little energizer bunny. So the next thing we had to do is, OK, we've got the team. We've got the chemistry. We've got the puzzle all put together. Now we have to come up with a winning plan. And we did. We did. The first thing that we wanted to do was to have fun together, was to enjoy each other, and develop the trust with each other, which, with each other, which isn't easy. Trust is one of the most challenging things to me, to really fully trust somebody and be vulnerable in that way. And we developed that. We had this great sense of trust. So the first year was all about having fun. And then the second year was, OK, let's try to see if we can get, be, make sure we're technically as good as we can, can be. And then going into the third year, see, so the year before the Olympic trials, right before we, it was at, right at the end of the season, I, I slipped and I fell, and I tore my ACL, MCL, and meniscus. So for those of you who don't know, I broke my knee. Not ideal. When you're an athlete, not ideal for anybody. Um, it takes about a year to recover from surgery. So that was going to take me right to basically to the fall before we were going to head into the Olympic year. And it was really devastating for me. I was so scared. We had all this plan. We had this dream. We had this belief. And all of a sudden, I'm injured. And it, it's career ending. And so I, I was in Switzerland at the time when I hurt myself. I was watching my fiance at the World Championship. And the head doctor for the, the World Championship, and this is just a little bit of a side story. Um, is an orthopedic surgeon. So it worked out really well for me. And uh, I went to see Dr. Weiskopf, and he looked, he, I, I insisted it was just muscular because I'm really stubborn, even though it was really not. And so he, he looked at me and he said, you know, you need to go and get an MRI. And I had this panic about me, this look. Our wonderful healthcare system does not cover MRIs in Switzerland. And, and Switzerland is incredibly expensive. And we're pretty much a not-for-profit type organization. So we didn't have, I just, I, I was panicked. And he looked at me and he could see my panic. And this is just to show you the kindness of humanity and the sense of community and all the people that came together to help us. He looked at me and he said, Jennifer, this is my contribution to Canadian athletics. There's no charge. And when we got to the Olympics, he was one of the first people I saw in the, in the dining hall. He came up and he picked me up off the ground and he gave me this big hug. And he's like, I'm so proud of you. I told you you could do it, and I'm so proud of you. And I'm cheering for you every step of the way, unless you play Switzerland. And I'm like, OK, fair enough. <laughs> but it, that, that's just a little bit of a side story. But I, so I tore my, my ACL, and, and I'm going to have to have surgery. OK, so I have this plan, and, we're, and you know, I'm going to have the surgery, and I'm, I'm scheduling everything. And I go and see my doctor, and I find out that I'm pregnant which is the most unbelievable news, because it's something that I'd wanted for so long, and it just never happened, and now it's happening. 
And so it changed the whole surgery process. Um, no pain meds allowed. But I always feel that everything happens for a reason. So when this was all happening, it's like, okay, well, if I was gonna hurt myself and I, I'm, I'm having a baby, well, let's just do it together. Kill two birds with one stone. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna play in the fall. So this way, and it allowed me, it allowed me to, because I had the surgery plan first, I had already planned to not play in that fall. And so the girls were prepared and they were actually, we found a way to, to be excited about it. Not be excited that I was hurt, but find kind of the silver lining in it. It's, it's like, hey, Jen's our leader, but she's gonna be gone. So let's just see how we perform. If, what if she couldn't play at the Olympics? Let's get that confidence. And then, so then I had Isabella, and they basically told me that I was gonna be off the entire fall with my, knee, with my knee surgery. And I managed to get back on the ice. They said, best case scenario, beginning of November, and I was back on the ice end of August, which was 10 weeks post-op. And uh, I was, based, I threw the day I went into labor and I was back on the ice a week later. <laughs> I'm a little crazy. But it sounds better. Isabella came four weeks early, so I was uh, only eight months pregnant. I didn't know that this was happening when I was practicing that day. And it really, it just, it gave me such a great perspective. And I always, again, everything happens for a reason. Knee surgery was way harder than having a baby. So it prepared me mentally to, to do it. And, and I was ready. I was so insistent that I was going to be ready to play that I was gonna be ready, that we had this plan, and that we were gonna be, we were gonna be ready for that Olympic trials. And right, right about when I had my knee surgery, we had, um, we had been approached by, by a, a company to help, help us with some funding. And then they found out I was pregnant and they backed off. They told me, you can't, you can't do this. You can't have a baby in surgery and come back, so we're out. I was devastated, I felt, I was just so devastated. And again, I talked to Cal and I was like, maybe I can't do all this. And again, he's like, why not you? I'm like, absolutely, why not me? I'll just do this and have a baby and, and it'll be great. But it, it made me so determined. When somebody tells me I can't do something, it's like, watch me. We can do anything we set our minds to. And I fully and wholeheartedly believe that. So off we go to the Olympic trials. And it was, one of the best experiences of our lives. We headed into that Olympic trials year and we felt like we had the plan. We had worked on so many aspects of our game. But the one thing we hadn't worked on is not being happy together. We were still honeymooners. All we could talk about is how much we loved each other. We were great, I love her, she's awesome. Well, what happens in those pressure situations when things aren't going your way? And you get grumpy. We hadn't experienced that. So what we did, we went to Beijing. We went to China in September the year before the Olympic trials. Uh, I guess about a year ago now, we were in China. And instead of focusing on the competition, we focused on touring as much as possible, on staying in a very bad hotel, on eating really bad food, and basically being grumpy. Like trying to tire ourselves out so that when we, when we made it to the Olympics and we heard all the stories about Sochi, that things weren't gonna be ready, that the food wasn't gonna be great, that we were gonna be jet lagged, we were gonna be prepared. So we were, we were grumpy. We toured all day, I had blisters on my feet and we, we tried to compete. And we did really well. But it was the first time that we showed up at a team meeting and we didn't have that look. It was one of the first times that we showed up and we didn't have that look. And we challenged each other on it. It's like, you know, we, we made an obligation to do this. And we found a way at the end of the competition to have that look. And I really believe that it's one of the reasons that we were so successful. The media reported that so she had so many flaws. For us, it was perfection. I can't say one bad thing about it, but we were ready for any flaws. It didn't matter. It was gonna be the experience of a lifetime for us, no matter what. And that's what everybody on TV said. Look at how much fun they're having. They're happy, they're enjoying it. Absolutely, we dreamed a lifetime for this moment. Nobody was gonna take that away from us. And it was, it was uh, Mike Babcock, actually, head coach for the Canadian men's hockey team. The crazy thing to me about the Olympics is how you're all one big team. You come together and you're just one big, amazing team. So it was about a week, about a week into the Olympics and we're in the athlete's village and he comes from behind us and he's like, you. And he's very intimidating, very intimidating man. I've never met him. He points at me, you. And I'm like, kind of back up. He's like, 
you have that look. I'm like, oh, okay, this is excellent. And we went back to the room and the girls were like, yeah, we have that look. <laughs> and, and it was in the closing ceremonies, he comes up to us again after we had won the gold medal. And he's like, I told you you had that look. And how amazing I thought that they could see it. They could see what I saw in Vancouver. He could see that in, ice, uh, in us. Mike Babcock, amazing coach of the Canadian men's Olympic hockey team, saw that we had a look, that we had magic. And that, those are the memories that will last a lifetime. I was so proud of us in that moment, that we did what we set out to achieve. And because of that, we performed our best. And we won as a team. We lost as a team along the way. The media would always blame Caitlin for the last four years whenever we lost, because before Caitlin, we won so much. So it had to be Caitlin's fault. But we stood there, and we won as a team, and we lost as a team. We stood united, and nobody would ever question that. And we had a trust. We never, ever doubted it, ever. So I asked myself over the last four years, probably why not me, a thousand times, that I believe that I could do absolutely anything. There's nothing that I couldn't achieve. And it brought back that fire inside me, that passion, that desire, that determination, but most of all, that childhood magic. As kids, we believe we can do anything. Anything is possible, and as adults, we turn into realists and a little bit of pessimists. And that's, that's just life. I mean, I always want things to be perfect, wrapped up in a little package, but perfection is not reality. But you can still have that passion, that desire, and that belief to achieve, to reach for the stars, and to go for it. And that's what, over the past four years, we did. And just by asking myself simple little questions about, you can do absolutely anything you set your minds to. So I stand here today as an Olympian, an Olympic gold medalist, I can't like to say that, <laughs> a lawyer and a mother. And nobody believed, so many people didn't believe that I could achieve all, all of those things at the same time. But here I am, I stand here today and I did it. And it was my mom who after we, this is a picture after we won the Olympic trials, she gave me the biggest hug. <laughs> I get emotional talking about it because it was just magic. She gave me a, the biggest hug and she whispered in my ear, she just said it was all worth it. It was all worth it. And I knew exactly what she meant. All of the heartache and the trials and tribulations, all of the pain, the sacrifice, all of her tears was all worth it in that moment. And you know what she is? She's always right. Moms are always right. She was. There was no better feeling in the world of being an Olympian I couldn't believe it when we were an Olympian, and never mind taking that step on that podium and being an Olympic gold medal. It is beyond words, the pride you feel. The only thing that comes close is being a mom <laughs> and living your life through the eyes of your baby where everything is possible. She reminds me every day to live life to the fullest, to enjoy the moment, and to be an inspiration. I want her to live life, to enjoy every second of it, and to believe that she can achieve everything. And in that moment, she, that's, I got that right before the gold medal game. She was in Canada, and I got that picture, go, mommy, go. And in that moment, I'm like, I'm not letting her down. She believes in me. We're going to do this. And I stand here today as an Olympic gold medalist, a shy introvert who loves sharing her story with people. People can do anything. Thank you very much. <laughs>